Okay, so why don't we, um, why don't we get started? Um, I just want to make a couple of announcements before we start, and then we're going to, I'm going to turn things over uh, to our wonderful speaker for tonight. So, uh, my name is Chris Murray. Um, I'm the president of DC Audubon Society, um, and I want to uh, welcome everybody uh, to our first um, kind of COVID-19 <laughs> online birding uh, activity. Um, you know, DC Audubon is um, adapting, as I'm sure we all are, to this new situation that we find ourselves in. And, and one of the real unfortunate aspects of the current environment is that we cannot do a lot of the programming um, that we so much enjoy doing at DC Audubon, uh, especially our, our monthly bird walks. Um, but uh, thankfully, uh, we got some wonderful responses to um, an announcement um, that we sent out a few weeks back uh, asking for people who would be interested in doing some online uh, bird uh, education programming for us. And tonight's speaker, uh, Julie Mallon, was the first person who reached out. Um, and so I really want to thank her for um, you know, taking the opportunity to, to share her expertise with us. Um, and I also just want to Having said that, um, you know, ask everybody if there are um, ideas that you have for programming that you would like us to do and see if we can put together. Um, we're happy to try to make it happen. So please feel free to reach out to us at info at dcaudubonsociety.org. And uh, whether it be a topic or a speaker that you know who you think might be willing to, uh, to spend some time with us, we, we want to put together as much programming as we can uh, in the near future so that um, even though we might not be able to get out as big groups and go birding, we can still learn a, a lot um, and, and stay engaged in, in a lot of the important work that, that not only are we trying to do, but other organizations um, in this area. So please let us know what you'd like us to try to do and, and we'll do our best. Um, just again, some logistics for tonight. Um, I just would ask everybody to to mute uh, their audio. Um, we will have some question time at the end. Um, and also uh, there's a chat box uh, that's been activated. So if a question that you have comes up during the presentation, please feel free to, to write it. Um, and and I'll, uh, I'm happy to kind of moderate some of those um, at the end of Julie's talk uh, as well. Um, so uh, without further ado, I wanna introduce everybody to our speaker tonight. Um, it is Julie Mallon. Uh, Julie is a PhD student at the University of Maryland. Uh, she previously studied at the University of West Virginia, uh, where she got her master's degree. Um, she has done uh, internships at the Max Planck Institute and also at um, Hawk Mountain uh, up in Pennsylvania, which is a wonderful place to visit. I, I visited there a couple years ago. I would definitely put a plug into that if you love raptors during migration season, um, a wonderful place to visit. Um, and Julie's uh, area of research uh, specialty, which she's going to be sharing with us tonight, is on turkey vultures, which uh, for all, you know, when we go on our, our monthly walks for DC Audubon, we always inevitably see turkey vultures, and they're such a wonderful species to kind of identify and talk a little bit about. And I know I'm really excited uh, to learn so much more about them uh, tonight from Julie. Um, so Julie, thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm going to turn things over to you. Um, she also has um, uh, some visuals uh, through PowerPoint and other, and other things, so uh, be sure to kind of minimize your screen so that you can see that. Um, and I look forward to talking to you more at the end when we get to questions. Thanks, Chris. Uh, is my audio okay? Thumbs up? Okay. Um, so again, yeah, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to share my research and just my passion for turkey vultures. So, um, this is going to be kind of more of a passion talk, but I'm going to throw a little bit of the highlights of my research in. Uh, and just a reminder, um, I'm not sure if Chris mentioned this, but you, everyone is being recorded on here. So um, just so everyone is aware. Um, okay, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Okay, 
So um, what I'm mostly going to be talking about are some of the really cool adaptations that turkey vultures have, which allow them to be both um, migratory and obligate scavengers, which is a rather unique combination among the bird world. Uh, and if you guys have any questions uh, for me during or after the talk, this is my email address um, and I'll try to revisit that at the end. Okay. Uh, so these are some of the things that we'll be, um, I'll be addressing today. Uh, first, what, uh, what is obligate soaring and what are the costs and benefits of it? Why don't all birds use obligate soaring? Um, and then the adaptive strategies that turkey vultures use in order to deal with competition with other scavengers like black vultures. Uh, also, why do turkey vultures have such large home ranges when other vultures don't? And uh, being a vulture is generally an energetic saving strategy um, because they aren't catching their food. They're trying to just find food that's available. Um, so understanding how much energy they actually use during flight is very important. And then also, since they're migratory, how do they minimize their energy costs during migration, which can be very expensive for most birds. So vultures briefly, uh, you'll recognize them as very large bodied birds. They're some of the largest that we have. Um, they belong to Accipitriformes, so they're related to hawks and eagles. Um, all of them are obligate soaring birds, and I'll get into that in a little bit. Um, and they all forage on the wing as obligate soaring birds, um, and most of them are obligate scavengers. There are two exceptions with the palm nut vulture and the bearded vulture. Both of those, um, the bearded vulture is scavenging on bones specifically, um, but the palm nut vulture will eat some more um, vegetative items uh, in its diet. Uh, and across the new and old world, we have 23 species of vultures. Uh, and our new old vultures, we have seven species that are all pictured here. And they are also in size order from smallest with the lesser yellow headed all the way to largest with the Indian condor. And we'll be talking about the turkey vulture. Uh, its closest relatives are the greater yellow headed and the lesser yellow headed vulture. Uh, and we can compare them briefly to old world vultures. There are more old world old world vultures, so I didn't want to overwhelm the slide, but here's just a selection of them. Um, and you can see that they do generally look pretty different from these new world vulture species. The Egyptian vulture kind of um, could arguably look a little more similar to the new worlds, but um, the Rupel's vulture, white-backed and Eurasian griffin vulture, um, they are kind of our classic Disney style vultures, um, and they do look generally um, pretty different from these ones, aside from the general large size, soaring, brown kind of bird um, traits. But both old world and new world vultures are convergent on the same um, lifestyle. So these birds, their common ancestor lived 70 million years ago. Uh, and then they diverged. Eagles, osprey, and the old world vultures all diverged off and we have just Catharidae, so those are the new world vultures, um, and they have just a very long lineage. Um, our birds, all of the birds that we have today, have uh, evolved in the last 15 million years, but there have been just older lineages of these new world vultures that have uh, previously gone extinct. Um, and right around here is the time of the Ice Age, um, so that may be one of the reasons why we don't have the um, older species of new world vultures built, um, around today. Uh, and interestingly, we have evidence that new world vultures were not new world vultures and old world vultures were not old world vultures and that we found fossils um, of old worlds in North America and new worlds in, um, in Europe. But the, all of the birds today are new world and old world exclusive. Um, and so I'll get into the costs and benefits of obligate soaring. So again, obligate soaring is when a bird can't use flapping flight um, 
uh, can't sustain themselves with flapping flight. Uh, they may flap sometimes, especially if you see black vultures, they, you often see them kind of flapping very hurriedly, um, but it's very short and they can't sustain themselves. They can't remain at a steady altitude uh, while doing so. And if they are flapping, they are probably gonna be losing altitude a little bit each time. And um, as large birds, they all have um, actually rather low body masses compared to their wingspans. So if we were to um, look, these are all the old world vulture species, but our turkey vulture is gonna be somewhere um, in this size near Egyptian and hooded vultures. Um, and then the largest vultures are over here. And you would see things like um, eagles being much lower um, below these lines where they're heavier, but they have a more similar wingspan to um, these smaller vultures here. So, um, so they actually fall lower um, than these birds on this line, which means that they're less energetically efficient in terms of soaring. Uh, and if you ever can see an eagle thermaling next to a vulture, you can definitely see um, that the eagle is not quite as graceful as the turkey vulture is. Um, and the advantage of having this low body mass to wing size ratio is that it allows them to use these weaker updrafts. And so these weaker updrafts might exist in just certain habitats um, all the time, like here in Eastern North America, we had generally have weaker updrafts um, or in early morning, late afternoon. Um, so these birds don't have to wait until high noon or live exclusively in deserts where the, the strongest thermals exist. Um, and so also allows for um, travel in a range of weather conditions. And then this also having a lower body mass um, allows them to have lower metabolic costs overall. Uh, and then just for a comparison of some similarly sized birds, we have the black-footed albatross and the golden eagle. And so these are pictures um, from publications that show the um, slides of their muscle fibers. And so here is a um, segment of, from the black-footed albatross, um, which has a 40% density of slow muscle. Um, so um, that's much more than it is for the golden eagle who doesn't rely on soaring. And you can see here, this bird is in the middle of a flap because it is carrying its food. And the difference here with the albatross is the albatross is stopping to feed and is not carrying its food while it's uh, feeding. So um, those are kinds of things that um, it's a trade-off in order to be an obligate soaring bird and uh, albatrosses would be considered obligate soaring, although they are um, pelagic soaring birds and not terrestrial soaring birds. Uh, and then also another disadvantage is that the vultures have lost their ability to grasp with their talons. So here we have a bald eagle and it just naturally, its talons just curl around the branch as a reflex, so it actually, um, all birds' feet, their natural relaxed position is to have their feet very kind of tightly curled and their, their talons tightly curled around their feet. Um, and they actually have to um, use effort to open um, their feet. And that allows them to you know, not fall out of the tree while they're, they're roosting and whatnot. Um, but vultures have flat feet, which allows them to walk around on the ground more easily and um, to deal with carrion uh, better. And then, um, for raptors, they use their talons as their killing mechanism, um, mostly, and their beak is more of a kind of a, a utensil, if you will. Um, but so this, even though vultures have very, very sharp beaks, they really cannot kill um, prey. Uh, so that is one of the reasons why with the obligate soaring um, comes obligate scavenging. Um, but another advantage of that is that they don't have to encounter prey, um, live prey, because those can occasionally be deadly. 
um, or at least uncomfortable as sometimes uh, rehab centers get birds with uh, porcupine quills and things like that. Um, and then one other consequence is that they can't build nests. So right now you might be seeing some osprey who have been carrying um, some sticks to build nests. Um, there's some that are down at Kenilworth Gardens doing that right now and uh, vultures can't do that. So they simply need to find a safe place to lay their eggs. And so they often do it in kind of hollowed out tree stumps, um, even abandoned cars or abandoned um, barns or, or shacks. Uh, and so I've mentioned a couple of buzzwords about flight. So flapping flight is what people generally think of. And this is a black vulture flapping. It's active. It requires a lot of energy and effort um, and also requires powerful muscles in order to do it for long periods of time. Instead, when vultures are soaring, they're soaring and gliding. Soaring would be the period when they're using environmental updrafts. Um, so they're getting a free ride and they're gaining altitude and then gliding is when they are uh, slowly losing altitude, but they're generally crossing the landscape um, very quickly. And so they're traveling more in a horizontal direction than in a vertical direction. Um, and this is very energetically efficient, but it requires special morphological adaptations. Uh, when these vultures are engaging in thermal soaring, um, they are looking for these thermals, which um, we don't have a lot of information on how they kind of find to detect them, but we think that it's more of a kind of instantaneous response to the feelings of the wind on their wings and they're very sensitive to direction and things like that. Um, so thermals are simply when the form, when the sun heats the ground unevenly. So if you have trees um, or something giving shade, you'll have a sunny spot, heat is going to be gaining in that small spot more rapidly than in the shaded spot and that causes um, a heat differential. And so the air is always trying to reach equilibrium and therefore we get, um, uh, we get rising hot air, um, which the birds can ride up. And then when they are at the top, they can um, glide across and then they can reach another thermal. Uh, another kind of lift you might see vultures using is orographic soaring. Um, and this is when winds are hitting uh, topographic relief, um, such as the Appalachian Mountains nearby. Um, and this uplift is very predictable, but also very spatially restricted. Um, and it does better, birds do better on certain days than others with the, the wind directions. Um, but there are a lot of hawk watch sites such as Hawk Mountain, Allegheny Plateau or Hawk Ridge that you can go to and um, the advantages of those places are that birds are flying directly over those spots because they're using orographic soaring. Um, and so now I'll discuss some of the adaptive strategies that chicken vultures use in order to deal with competition um, of birds such as black vultures, but also this would apply to other kinds of um, non obligate scavengers such as mammals. Um, so a turkey vulture, their um, Latin name, their scientific name is Cathartes aura, which means breezy cleaner, which I think is very elegant. Um, and they weigh between one to two kilos. So even though they have a six foot wingspan, they are very, very light. They are the most abundant species of vulture with, we have millions, we, we don't know how many there are, but there are um, several million. Um, they have a very wide distribution all the way from Canada to the Falkland Islands. Uh, and some populations are long distant migrants, some um, don't migrate at all and they occupy almost every habitat type. And these are considered more solitary foragers than the black vultures um, for comparison. Their scientific name is Corgips atratus, um, and they weigh a little bit more than the turkey vulture and have this uh, a very, a very similar but slightly shorter wingspan than the turkey vulture, which makes them a little bit heavier um, in terms of um, uh, lift. And they're also very highly abundant and increasing in range. 
They're not considered to be migratory, although there's some evidence that they are kind of local migrants migrating from um, areas like Virginia Beach to, um, to Shenandoah and back, or Blacksburg. So there's kind of some small migratory movements in there. They prefer open and human dominated habitats um, and they are highly gregarious and they forage in groups and I almost always see them in pairs at least. Uh, and so when you are out in the fields, you don't often get to see them perched on a branch like those last pictures. So you usually get to see them in the sky. So uh, look at some diagnostics here. On the left, we have the turkey vulture. And so, you know, they have the similar colors and they have kind of similar light spots on their, some of their flight feathers, but the turkey vultures have much more um, lightness under their wing here. Uh, whereas the black vultures, it's really ex um, exclusive to the fingertips, as I like to call it, um, kind of like a glove effect. Um, turkey vultures, sometimes you can see their red head and their white bill. Um, juveniles will have much darker heads, um, so that can be kind of confusing with the black vulture, so it's not a perfect diagnostic. Um, but more of the shape of the bird, even though they um, at, at first glance seems so similar, uh, is actually very helpful. So turkey vultures have a narrower wing um, and their wingspan is a little bit longer in comparison to the black vulture who have slightly wider wings. Um, and this is, effect is enhanced by the shape of their tails. So the turkey vultures have, again, have these long narrow tails um, that really stick out in profile um, compared to their wings, whereas the black vulture, you can barely tell where their tail starts and, um, and ends compared to the wings. So um, when they're really high up in small size, I refer to these guys as a, a black jelly bean. They just, that's the perfect shape to describe them. Um, but the turkey vultures, usually you can see the tail much more distinctly. Um, but a, another diagnostic, um, not perfect, but very useful is this V shape. It's called a dihedral. Um, so um, we use these in airplane technology because it's you know really great for dealing with turbulence and I'll talk a little bit more about it. But the turkey vultures um, always hold their wings in this posture, whereas black vultures generally hold their wings in a flat posture, but will occasionally um, switch to a dihedral when the winds are highly turbulent. Um, and importantly, um, the turkey vultures forage using olfaction um, as well as vision, but black vultures, there's no evidence that they can forage using olfaction or sense of smell. Um, and so they seem to only forage using vision, using vision, which is why foraging in groups is much more important for these guys, where turkey vultures can find food on their own more easily because they can smell it in addition to seeing it. Um, and so just to quickly recap what I've gone over so far, um, for albacore soaring birds, um, it's energetically efficient, but at a cost of the ability to pursue prey. So they have to rely on the ephemeral nature or deal with the ephemeral nature of carrion as that kind of cost. And this vulture here is visiting a compost pile in the woods. Um, and the only reason why this turkey vulture would show up here at this compost pile is because they use olfaction to find their food. So they can't see very well over um, all of these trees. You can't see anything under the hay um, until you get right up close to whatever is underneath it. Um, so they are very, very sensitive to using olfaction. Um, and then um, I'll talk a little bit more about contoured soaring. Um, but generally, these two combined allow them to reach carrion first over other birds, um, which really gives them a very strong advantage. So um, is anyone familiar with this hand signal when you're birding or someone else has been with you birding um, or this? This is what uh, we call the kind of the chuvu hand signal. It kind of just mimics the behavior of what you see uh, a turkey vulture doing uh, when you're out birding. 
uh, and just throwing up a happy birthday to my sister who's uh, in the audience. Um, so what that hand signal is, is mimicking contoured soaring, which is something that turkey vultures do the most and um, other birds do much less than turkey vultures. Um, but it's extremely important to their um, adaptive strategies and, or, and being widespread. So uh, we describe this as being a variable um, rocking motion, either vertically or horizontally and kind of all over the place. Um, it kind of seems almost like surfing on waves. And you most commonly see this when you're driving down the highway or along some sort of tree line. And so these turkey vultures here are about 25 meters. They're just over the trees. Um, you can see a, a light post here for reference. And so they're really not high off the ground. And if these trees weren't here, they would run out of uplift very quickly and they'd have to switch to flapping or find a thermal. Um, but as long as there's trees, they can really kind of just fly along um, those trees without any effort. And I'm going to show you a video that kind of demonstrates exactly what I'm talking about. So although the bird is circling a little bit, it's not thermaling because um, thermaling they generally are gaining altitude and contorted soaring, they're almost always staying um, at the same altitude, definitely below 50 meters and generally around 25 meters or right around tree height. And so they're rocking back and forth and they can go very fast, um, but they're just, they're kind of all over the place. Um, and then there's another video which shows them, oops, sorry, let me, um, shows a little bit more up close. And here you can actually hear the wind a little bit in this video. So really high windy days or areas where there's something that is going to block the wind flow and cause it to deflect are perfect for turkey vultures. And so you can see the dihedral in action here. So this allows wind to move under their wings without knocking them over. If they had a flat wing posture, um, they could potentially flip over, although I don't ever see that happen with black vultures, but black vultures definitely struggle more in these kinds of conditions than turkey vultures. And so they're actually able to kind of transfer horizontal um, winds into vertical winds because their wings are at a slight angle. Um, and so here's kind of a diagram of that kind of turbulence. So this is what we would call mechanical turbulence, where if the world was a perfect sphere, we would just have air flowing in these layers straight across forever. Um, but as soon as something comes along, it gets deflected, it can't go through it, has to go around it. Um, and this causes some sort of um, these gaps that have feedback. And this is exactly where the uplift is coming from along these trees. Um, and thermals are also a form of turbulence, but it's a convective turbulence where the sun is heating the ground unevenly um, and then heat is rising and then there's areas where it's a little bit cooler where um, air is descending. And then in between we have these kinds of circular motions here. So the birds are able to kind of circle around and um, gain altitude before gliding across. Uh, and so for my master's research, I was describing that contorted soaring behavior, which has not been described by science before, but as I was a budding birder then, um, I became acquainted with the notion that many of you and other birders were very familiar with this behavior. So there are a lot of things that uh, science isn't 100% um, keen on um, because we, um, we don't spend as much time out in the field as people who, um, citizen sciences and people who are just um, lean towards um, naturalist hobbies. Um, and so I did a 
my master's and I did a scientific study to compare the, this behavior and to see and to see if black vultures and turkey vultures used contoured soaring the same way. And so I was looking at these four different categories. Um, and here is the altitude. Um, so this is the, a log transform, which just makes this graph um, a little bit easier to read, but the differences in altitude would, would be much greater. So this is around 25 meters, um, and this one's around 100 meters uh, up to 200. So we just kind of squished down the plot a little bit. Um, and these stars mean that there's significant differences between the two species, and you can see that there are no stars above contoured soaring. So contoured soaring is the only flight that both black and turkey vultures have to use it at the same altitude. And that is simply because of the physics where they're using the winds that are deflected over some physical blockage in the environment. Um, and that dissipates rapidly as you get away from that object. So um, black vultures, even though they don't like flying at low altitudes, they have to if they want to use contoured soaring. Um, they much prefer to be at higher altitudes because they use vision to forage um, and they can see a larger, larger portion of the landscape and watch other black and turkey vultures and watch for them who might be detecting food. Um, and then I also looked um, at the proportion of time to see if turkey vultures or black vultures use contoured soaring um, at different rates. And I found that turkey vultures did use contoured soaring more than black vultures, um, at least twice as often and around 30%, which is a significant amount of time for something that had not been described yet um, until the last few years. Um, and black vultures, um, if they're not using contoured soaring, um, they are more frequently using thermal soaring. Um, and that is the type of updrafts that they prefer and fits best with their morphology and their foraging style. Uh, and so again, here is a, a nice picture of the dihedral, that B shape of their wings. Um, and so using the couture soaring, you might have winds that are kind of horizontal that actually get caught on the wings and uh, create this vertical force up. Um, and this is perfect for olfactive foraging because in order for a turkey vulture to, to find the food source in a forest where it can't see the food, it needs to smell it, it needs to be, get very close to it, it needs to sample um, the air all around it in order to pinpoint the direction that it's coming from. Uh, so this requires long duration, low altitude flights in order to get as close to the source as possible. And so that is why this dihedral has evolved. I'm not sure which one evolved first, but um, they definitely have kind of co-evolved, and these are the perfect pair of uh, adaptations to allow for this more solitary, widespread foraging of an obligate scavenger. Um, and so because we have these two different behaviors, contoured soaring at low altitudes and then thermal soaring at, and visual foraging at high altitudes, um, we can see that there's potentially differences in how and what carrion might be actually used in the environment. So at high altitudes, the birds are going to be looking for larger things that they can see, such as cattle or deer or roadkill. Um, and they're not going to be looking for mice or squirrels, things that are very, very small um, at really high altitudes, 200, 500 meters. Um, and, but at low altitudes, they're able to take advantage of any kind of carrion that's available in a forested environment where they wouldn't otherwise be able to see it. Um, and they're also able to uh, take advantage of that small concealed carrion, like the um, compost pile that was covered in hay or um, mice in their burrows. Um, vultures will occasionally take those. So. Um, this is, these are the two reasons why black vultures, black vultures and turkey vultures are able to coexist so well because they really take um, two different parts of the carrion niche, um, even the, uh, across 
all of North America. Um, it's just uh, the two of them and they're able to consume a lot of the carrion that's available and not let it go to waste. And then a fun fact, uh, I love this picture because this one shows two of um, my favorite behaviors of turkey vultures. So they're queuing here, they're standing in line. They don't like to be um, too aggressive, although that can differ when you're talking within a species, but they, um, uh, they're not as aggressive as black vultures when at a carcass. Um, and especially if another turkey vulture is there, they don't wanna take their food away from them. So they just rather wait and, and um, get a bite later. And then if they have to run, they do this kind of pirate hobble away where they kind of do this skip with one leg. It's, uh, it's very funny to watch, so. Um. Okay, moving on. Uh, I'll talk about why turkey vultures have the largest range of any vulture species. And if you weren't aware that turkey vultures coexist with emperor penguins, now you do, and this is in the Falkland Islands. So that is the um, most Southern part of their range. And they feed almost exclusively on penguin colonies and, um, and sheep, which are the primary livestock of people living in the Falklands. Uh, and there are few other migratory vultures, the only other long distance migratory vulture would be the Egyptian vulture, um, the, the gyps vulture, um, or the European griffin vulture is somewhat migratory, uh, migrating from France and Spain into um, northern Africa through the um, Strait of Gibraltar. Um, uh, but focusing on the turkey vulture, Here's a map of some of the populations that Hawk Mountain has been studying over the last 20 years. Um, and so we have these three main populations. This population breeds in Saskatchewan and then uh, overwinters in Venezuela. Here we have a population here that's tagged in Arizona and uh, also will migrate down to Central America and Northern South America. And then we have the South American population which breached down here and then will migrate north here. Um, and they have, as you could see, a very large range. Um, and there's a very interesting study, a theoretical study um, on the effect of the occupation or the presence of other vultures and how that might affect the success of um, foraging vultures. As I said, they have to um, find their own food, but sometimes that's hard. And, some, and oftentimes they're finding food that's greater than they could consume. So there's no reason why multiple vultures can't share the same food resources. And they are simply dependent on when food is available, you know, when animals die and where they are, they have to go to them. Um, and so those are some obstacles that they have to overcome every day. Um, and it's a lot easier when you have, even though there's more competition, it's easier when there's other birds around, at least there's a minimum or maybe there's an optimal number of vulture neighbors you might have in order to kind of to eavesdrop on them and see, you know, if they can find other food. Because then you just simply have more eyes in the sky um, looking around for carrion and able to, to find something. Um, and you'll note here that there's no other vulture species that are in the, this part of their range. Um, and so but everywhere else you'll at least have black vultures. Um, and then throughout South America, you have the other species of vultures that will, they will coexist with. Um, so in order for them to be the only vulture species there and to exist at rather low densities, um, they really have to rely on a few of those adaptations that we kind of talked about earlier. Number one being olfaction. So this allows them to find smaller meals more quickly, which allow them to kind of make it, um, you know, a few more days if they haven't been able to find a larger meal uh, and allows them to exist with fewer vultures. Um, they're also habitat generalists, so uplift, is generally weaker in these areas, except for in those very short southern months, summer months. Um, 
And so they could switch to contoured soaring um, where they're using the uplift that's over the trees or, or graphic soaring. Um, and so they can use those more than other birds and that is um, optimal for them being kind of the only birds in these areas. Uh, and lastly, they are one of the smaller species of vultures. They, most of them weigh less than two kilograms. Um, so this allows them to be more efficient uh, and in terms of metabolism and allows them to go more days without food. And they also have to carry less food as well um, and makes flight easier. So, um, so all of these kind of forces have been acting on these, um, these individuals and in shaping evolution um, for the last several million years, which is uh, very fascinating. Uh, so speaking of energy, how much energy do they require to fly? Uh, so one of Hawk Mountain's first studies on vultures was with a bird uh, aptly named Butterball. Uh, captured in 2003 and they had a, um, a telemetry unit that looks like this. It's like a backpack that has a solar panel on it um, and it records their location and time. And that's the only thing it records. Um, they also put in a separate logger that records their heart rate um, and body temperature. And this bird migrated from Pennsylvania where it was caught and then all the way down to Florida. Uh, and then migrated back. Uh, and so I used this bird's heart rate data in order to assess how much energy vultures use to fly. We, what we do know from other stud studies is that soaring requires about only two times their basal metabolic rate, which is the amount of energy you would use if you were just laying in bed for 24 hours a day and not doing anything. Um, and so for reference, walking is about three times basal metabolic rate. Humans are very um, evolved to be very efficient walkers. So, um, but it's very impressive that the soaring can be even lower than that. And then for reference, flapping is at least seven times basal metabolic rate up to 22 times basal metabolic rate, depending on how large the bird is. The, the larger the bird, the more flapping costs. So you can see that to, in order to flap a great distance, it would be very, very energetically inefficient. Uh, and so, yeah, so we use the heart rate data um, in order to assess how, how they're using energy during migration. And let's see if this will move. Here we go. Okay, so here um, I simply annotated the migration of this single bird and um, they departed their migration on um, September 30th and they flew 851 miles uh, and they were in flight for 118 hours but if you look down here their total trip time was almost 800 hours so most of that time was not spent in flight most of that time was spent roosting um, and things like that so they really only spend at most a third of their day in flight uh, and so this calculated to an average mean flight speed of only um, 11.6 kilometers per hour. Their maximum flight speed was 41 kilometers per hour, which is um, rather slow for, for um, a vulture. Um, and they consumed a total of 629 grams of fat, which is about two kilometers per gram of fat, which is very, very efficient overall. Um, but to put that in terms of how much did a vulture need to eat in order to um, attain that 630 grams, for humans, that would be seven and a half sticks of butter or six, almost seven sticks of butter. For a turkey vulture, that would be one uh, cottontail rabbit, but uh, cottontail is actually bigger than they could consume in one sitting, so that would have to be at least two or three meals. So, um, uh, yeah. So definitely don't substitute butter for rabbit. Not, don't recommend that. But um, uh, yeah, so knew, knowing that information, 
we can now look at how turkey vultures minimize their energy costs during migration. Um, so looking at to see if they uh, behave differently in, in any way in order to kind of minimize those costs even further. Um, and so uh, one thing that's uh, important to note is that as I mentioned, turkey vultures are very, very abundant and they, a lot of them migrate through Central America. And so this causes kind of a huge traffic jam and a lot of competition when they get to Central America. So we have this one population I was telling you about here that's in, from um, Southern Canada. Um, and they all kind of come through the Great Plains and they funnel in along this coast through Corpus Christi and past Veracruz, Mexico, and then they, meet up with the populations of turkey vultures that are from the western US and the southwest. And so these birds all who are breeding up north come down along the coast and they um, meet here um, down in southern Mexico. And so then you have even more vultures all together. And it, you can imagine if kind of like recent events where if everyone's trying to eat at the same time, you're going to run out of food. So we generally expect that vultures are not feeding when they're on migration because there are millions of them every year uh, moving through the same area. And um, we just think that the competition has to be too high. And also they are, they can't, even if they see something that they could potentially kill, they, they can't, they don't have the physical ability to pursue and kill prey, so they have to find something that's already dead. Um, so it's unlikely to, to find something like that in, you know, a week or two weeks where they might be moving through this, this area. So generally we think that they do not feed during migration. Um, and this is generally the area of their wintering grounds. Um, move forward. Um, and so we, we caught, I talked a little bit about this with the um, different kinds of updrafts. Um, but in addition to them not feeding, we do find that they do stop during migration, um, looking at the data. And the only other explanation for this behavior is that they're doing it because of weather. Um, and so we see this a lot. Here is an example of the, um, the Euro uh, Eurasian griffin vulture who is stopped in Spain at the Strait of Gibraltar um, in order to cross that water barrier and they're waiting for really good updrafts. Um, but this happens all the time. Um, while the birds are overland uh, during migration, just because it really poor conditions can uh, quickly destroy these kinds of uplifts and then they can't fly. Um, and so I found that over 65% of the stopovers that the birds use are in response to weather conditions. Um, and if any of you are familiar with migration and stopover behavior of other birds, such as shorebirds or passerines, um, you know that the stopovers are very common, and, uh, but they are almost always used for feeding and birds will often move through bad weather. Um, and those are when we get those like really cool vagrants who are pushed along through um, with hurricane winds and things like that, um, but not the case for vultures. So they behave very differently from other birds in terms of using stopovers. Um, but I did find evidence that uh, some of the stopovers that they're using are probably for feeding. Um, and so not all birds have to feed um, and only about half of the migrations they're going to be feeding during. Um, so there's a lot of variability there and so that's my job for the rest of my dissertation is to try to figure out kind of what explains that variability there. Um, sorry. Uh, okay, so sorry, you can't see the title here, but um, this one says that the um, distance 
traveled does not affect energy consumption, but migratory progress does affect energy consumption here. So here, each point is, this is one migration, and these are um, simply per day. Um, at the end of each day, they get a point, and you can see that the spacing between these points is very different. Um, and every day, they're using the same amount of energy, about 20, 25 grams uh, of body mass is consumed. Um, so, but you don't see any variability in these colors. But when you get over here to per distance, so instead of having it per day, I divided it by equal distances. Um, you can see these colors are very different from blue all the way to red. Here's red, blue, and some orange in between. So you can see that they're actually spending more time in these areas um, with these colors, and that is what's causing them to spend more energy in those areas. So this would actually be kind of considered a stopover. Um, these ones also considered these short, shorter stopovers, um, either in response to weather or potentially for feeding. Um, but this is um, really good evidence for how they are navigating the challenges of dealing with expensive migration and being energetically efficient at the same time. And we can look at this a different way. Um, so this is the same migration. Um, same migration here on the right, and then instead of um, by breaking it down by day, I, um, I'm comparing spring versus fall. And so here in the fall migration, this one took 45 days, and in that 45 days they had 79 hours of stopover. Uh, and you can see these stopovers here were in these two locations with these very large circles, which is the amount of um, uh, the distance. So they flew a very small distance. Um, so they also did two stopovers here during the spring, um, but they only had 58 hours of stopover and their total was 33 days. But if you do the math real quick, the difference between 33 days and 45 days is not the same difference between 58 hours and 79 hours. So they are simply in addition to having fewer hours, hours of stopover, they're actually moving a lot faster during the spring. Um, and for this, we don't know why. There are several potential reasons. One could be that the thermals are better in the spring um, and that they are um, able to move more quickly because the uplift conditions are better. And that's um, generally a phenomenon that we observe with soaring birds, um, but also, most, soar, most, most birds um, have an urgency to return to their breeding grounds um, as an instinct uh, and also to reclaim territory, meet up with mates if they're monogamous. So these are also factors which might cause them to push through. So they might maybe use flapping more often or might soar in a more risky manner. By soaring in a risky manner, I mean not thermaling to their full height um, before gliding, they might thermal halfway up and then glide, um, which is a risk because they hit the ground sooner if they don't find another thermal. Uh, so there's lots of different potential explanations, but we see this every year. The spring migration is always shorter. They use stopovers um, during both of them, but simply they're just not making the, the, the same progress as they are in, in the fall versus the spring. And so I mentioned that some of the birds feed um, and what I found, uh, which is really interesting, is that when and where they feed matters. So looking at this graph here is just a plot of locations the birds migrate and also the red ones are where they do feed. So you can see there's a lot more of these feeding stops here in the continental US. Um, there's like two stops down here in the Central America, but almost all of them are as soon as you hit Texas. Um, so this is important because if the bird is over, is a spring migration, they're overwintering and they're trying to return to their breeding grounds, they can't, assuming that it's because of competition and lack of food, they can't feed until they hit Texas. So um, they're flying half of their migration without feeding. Um, and this is actually the, the most beneficial 
position to be in because if they are carrying, if they feed very early and they're carrying extra food, extra weight, that's going to increase their metabolic costs and that's going to reduce how far they can fly on the fat that they've already stored um, or reduce their body weight at the end of their migration. So in the spring, they end up with the, the highest body mass in the end, even if it's the exact same number of days um, that they're migrating because of simply they're feeding before, um, before the first half or after the first half of their migration. Uh, and that's it. That's the only variable that's different. And we compare it to doing the exact same migration, but in the fall, you see that their, their end body mass here on the y-axis is much lower, so it's much less favorable for them to migrate this way. So that might also be why they migrate more quickly in the spring, because they can afford it, because they have these extra calories that they can consume um, in order to get there, whereas in the fall, they have to be much more cautious and uh, risk adverse when they are migrating through because they know if they don't feed before they leave Texas, they can't feed until they reach their wintering grounds. And that could potentially spell disaster if they don't have enough food um, stores in their bodies. Uh, and then looking at this, at those three populations I showed you earlier, um, I calculated the number of days of migration here on the y on the x-axis and then this is missing a, uh, a, a label here but it should be the percent of body mass that they used. So in green is the the longer distant migrant from southern Canada, um, orange and purple are western U.S. and southwest U.S. so they are um, similar um, similar body masses, similar distances of migration. Um, and as a general rule, we, uh, we believe that raptors can't carry more than 30% of their body mass as fuel stores. So using this as kind of an upper limit, you can see that very conveniently, this is the same as the distance of the migration for the Southwest and Western US birds. So theoretically, these birds have evolved in order to not feed during migration, but the central Canada birds, some can maybe get away with not feeding dur during migration, but most of them will have to feed during migration um, because they travel a much greater distance. Uh, and when I was talking about some stopovers, um, this is one of the examples of what I meant. Uh, and if you are interested in kind of what these graphs are talking about, um, I can answer questions or do demonstrations after the talk. Um, but this is, I'm looking at a small segment of time that the bird um, spent overnight. So this is the last movement period and then it found a roost and it stopped uh, and then it continued on the next day. But looking at the time here, you see that it doesn't take off until 11 o'clock, which is rather late for vultures. We generally think that they, uh, on a good day, will leave the roost by 8 a.m. Um, so for some reason, this bird did not leave until 11, which we consider a different kind of stopover, a weather-induced stopover, probably because it was raining or cloudy um, early in the morning. And then there's other stopovers. This one is over three days here in the beginning where it's just not moving. And then it takes off and continues on its way. Um, so for some reason, it was for two days, it was staying in one spot. And so this is probably also in response to weather. Because if they were feeding, we would see a little bit more movement than you see there. Um, and so I asked the question, do they respond to weather? Is this actually in response to weather? And I looked at several variables. Um, and this red line here for all of these is simply the start of the stopover. And these blue lines here are the change in these variables. This is a change in temperature. So four hours before the stopover, the, change, the temperature was increasing. And then at the stopover, the temperature was um, decreasing um, actually, and then afterwards. And so I was looking at, does, do these red lines line up with the peak um, or the trough of any of these weather variables? And I found that for tailwinds, um, 
if there's no tailwinds, the birds aren't moving. If total atmospheric water, which is related to humidity, is very high, they're not moving. If the precipitation is high, they're not moving. If wind speed is very low, they're not moving. So these are very important factors for um, the uh, presence of updrafts. So simply, they're not moving because they can't. Um, and then I checked also with the end of the stopovers, um, and the purple and green denote that these variables are unique for the start of the stopover, and these green ones are unique for the end of the stopover. Yellow are important for both. So in order to stop a stopover or take off and begin migrating again, they really need good thermal conditions. So when thermal conditions are at their greatest, um, where they're increasing the most, that's when they're going to take off. And the same as temperature. Temperature is often correlated with thermal um, strength. And then again, wind speed is going to be increasing. Um, and then precipitation is going to be decreasing or none. So um, there's really good evidence that a lot of these birds are responding very, very quickly in response to weather, but they're also, they're not extending their stay any more than they have to. Um, just so, just to summarize these results, um, talked about why turkey vultures have the largest home range of any vulture species, and the three reasons were because they use olfactive foraging um, uniquely. It's um, also found among the lesser yellowhead and the greater yellowhead vultures, their closest relatives, but none of the other vulture species. There's good evidence for that, um, including the old world vultures. They're also habitat generalists um, because of that dihedral and their light body size or their light body mass. They're able to persist in, you know, in most habitats um, while the larger bodied uh, vultures in the tropics of the new world and old world are really restricted to the more arid um, or uh, topographic um, areas of high topographic relief like condors. Uh, and then how much energy do turkey vultures use um, in order to fly? So I said about seven sticks of butter for migration. That's how many grams of fat that they actually would uh, use and consume. But if you calculate that by day, it's the same number of calories that you would get from an egg. So, um, so rather small and they can go on many many days without feeding although i'm sure they don't enjoy it um, but in the scientific literature um, at least uh, 20 days is the longest recorded known um, number of days that they can go without food uh, and then how do they minimize energy costs during migration. So I found that the activity that they were doing, stopping or flying, didn't affect how much energy they were using, but it did increase with time. So the longer the migration was or the slower they were migrating, that was the biggest cost um, in terms of energy. And so they can save energy by waiting as long as possible to eat, which lightens their load and uses less metabolism or to move them throughout the, the air and causes less resistance. Um, and so with that, I'd like to acknowledge everyone who's gotten me here to this point. There's a smattering of my master's and my PhD work. Um, and so all of my collaborators and all of the students at the University of Maryland who's helped me with my research. Um, and with that, I would be happy to take any questions. This is a black culture bag. Wonderful, thanks, Julie. Um, so we had a couple of questions come in. Um, several of them, I'll, I'll try to combine them all because they all um, revolve around the question of migration. Um, so basically, the question is kind of why, why do some of them migrate and some not? What is kind of the trigger for them migrating? Is it lack of, of carrion? Um, and one of our, our participants uh, is from originally from Nicaragua, and he says um, that he sees turkey vultures and black vultures there year round. So are those kind of residents who've decided not to migrate? Kind of how how would we kind of explain a lot of these kind of factors about why some might migrate and some might not? 
Yeah, those are really great questions. Um, so migration is really a spectrum um, and that there's very, very few populations that you would actually describe as com like obligate migrants. The one that one population in green from Saskatchewan is one, ex um, uh, one exception to that because there's, um, it's too cold, there's not enough updrafts and um, not enough carrion for them to persist in Canada um, over winter. But here we have a different sub race or subpopulation or subspecies, sorry, subspecies in the Eastern. Um, and it's a larger bird and they, the one graph I showed, they migrate down to Florida, but it's a partially migratory population. So some birds decide to migrate, some birds decide not to. It can change by year, but it's often more of a genetic component um, whether that decides whether they migrate or not. And simply this will change in the population, It'll increase or decrease in the population if the birds that migrate um, are more successful in breeding and raising young than the birds that don't migrate or maybe they, maybe they didn't survive the, the winter. And so that would increase the migratoriness of a population. But the opposite can be true if that if they're taking on unnecessary costs by migrating and maybe they're competing a lot at the wintering grounds with the, all these other vultures, if they're able to survive the winter okay, then, and then they are they're already at the breeding grounds, they get the first pick, then they are set and they are going to produce more young than the ones that are migrating. So um, it's, it's simply a balance um, and it really depends on the conditions. It can change over time. And I expect with climate change, there will be some changes in the pressures, um, especially with that one long distance migratory population um, that will affect their survival there. Um, and yeah, so there's definitely residential vultures um, uh, almost everywhere, um, and especially the black vultures in Nicaragua. Uh, definitely, there would be the Ruficulus subpopulation. Um, there are some minor notes um, that I didn't get into uh, that you could tell the differences in their kind of plumage. Um, I think there's like a, a spot on the back of their head which would kind of show you whether it's a, um, uh, a migrant or a non-migrant. Interesting. Um, another question, and you kind of got to a dimension of this at the end when you mentioned how long uh, they can go sometimes without eating, but one of the questions was, how much do they need to eat to sustain themselves? Um, and also another part of that same question, do they, do they live in groups? Um, so they don't persist in, well, they don't persist in groups that you'll often find them in very large communal roosts. Um, they like that. I think it's in terms of safety also for um, warmth and they uh, often prefer kind of like pine trees to roost in. So I think that might have to do with um, a little bit with warmth, but also eavesdropping. So I kind of mentioned a little bit that they will spy on each other and watch each other for signals of, you know, he has food, so I'm going to go follow him, um, or even uplift. I think that some of them are spying on each other just to see where there's a good thermal, and so that they don't have to um, chance it themselves. They can glide over there and get in that thermal and get some height. Um, so both of those are reasons why you might see them um, kind of coexisting. And then can you remind me the second part of that question? Oh, yeah. um, how much do they need to eat to sustain themselves? Um, so not a lot. They, in captivity, they f are fed about 100 grams, which is like a large mouse um, or two, two mice. Um, and uh, when they are fasting, so when they're migrating, we actually expect that their metabolism is lower. And so they can decrease their metabolism up to 30%, which is a huge energetic savings. Um, by simply just kind of shutting down the di digestive system for a few days. And so I think that's um, another uh, adaptation that they have. At least old world vultures have it. So we suspect that new world vultures also have that as well. Um, and so, yeah, roughly 100 to 200 grams if they're feeding every day. Um, but they can definitely make do 
um, with less and make up for the loss later. Okay, good. Um, another question that just came in, do they have any vocalizations? I've, and I've heard that black vultures don't. Uh, I don't know if I, I'm right on that, but uh, if you could speak to whether turkey vultures do. Yeah, they don't. They, um, they make a hissing sound if you get kind of um, close to them, but they lack a syrinx. So that's the, the very powerful muscle that the birds used in order to, to make you know, multiple notes um, simultaneously. And we get those really beautiful bird songs for the passerines um, and they lack it. And so for a long time, people actually thought that they were related to storks because storks also lack a syrinx, but that's simply what we would call convergent evolution. Um, they also, I didn't mention this, but they use your hydrosis, which is another um, commonality with storks, which we think is a um, disinfecting mechanism. So they, um, as you're walking around and carrying, you're going to get some microbes on, on your, um, your feet and things like that. And so if they urinate directly on their legs, that would sanitize it. Um, and we learned that because people would band them like other birds, but that would actually cauterize on their leg and they would lose their legs. So that's why now, if you see a, a banded vulture, it's a, with a, a wing tag. So they have like a, a big cattle tag on their wing. It's blue or yellow or some kind of vinylish um, bright color with numbers. And so that's the tagging strategy that we use with the vultures. Um, okay, great. Uh, another question. Do they have any natural predators? Anything larger than them? Um, Definitely, like a, a they're, they seem to be the most sensitive when they're on the ground. Um, when they are feeding on carrion, they feel um, very vulnerable. And so if you approach them, they'll run away. Um, if they've eaten, they will have a difficult time getting off the ground. And so they'll often vomit in defense, um, not, not to spray it, but in order to lighten their load and, and take off quickly, because if they've eaten too much, it, it will take some time for them to get off the ground. Um, and uh, so that's why they're vulnerable, um, especially in the middle of the road, like for, for roadkill. So they generally avoid uh, roadkill unless it's at a very safe distance. Um, and so the, the predators that they have are, are long gone. Uh, wolves and, and large cats and things like that. But um, if those were to increase, that, that could be. Okay. Another question about, so what is it that they smell in the carrion that helps them identify it? And is there anything that is too old or I guess too dead for them to actually detect um, from flight? Uh, yes. So they I couldn't tell you the actual name of the compound, um, but there is um, a, an odor that gas companies actually mimic. They, they add it to their natural gas. And so if they find vultures that are circling over their pipelines, they'll know they have a leak because these vultures are thinking that there's food there. And so um, it's like a really, um, great way that we've been able to kind of take advantage of that adaptation. So there's simply just a compound that they're recognizing um, that's in, um, that's part of the de decomposition process. Uh, and they do definitely have preferences for how old the carrion is. About a day old, in order for it to be old enough to smell, but not too smelly, um, is great. As soon as it starts like getting like really mushy and stuff, they don't, it's not, um, it's not quite as tangible and not helpful because then it's too decomposed by microbes. And um, although their stomachs can definitely handle it, their stomachs can um, can metabolize like almost any virus or anything that's in there. Um, I think they prefer things that are a little bit more solid than uh, than liquid form, not to be too gross. But. And I guess kind of off of that, I guess as I'm thinking about it, with there being so many of these out there that we, you know, that we just see casually, it just amazes me that there's that much carrion out there. I mean, I, I guess I can't imagine that there's just this many mice, rodents, whatever, just kind of dropping dead, laying around. Yes, um, that's something that I'm always, you know, astounded by how much um, food is out there and how they're able to like how there's millions of vultures and they're able to persist you know and increase in size actually yeah 
So I guess the, the last question, and maybe this kind of brings us all the way back to the beginning that we got, and, and then I'll, I'll open it up if anybody has something else, but just kind of, how did you get interested in turkey vultures in the first place? Kind of where did, where did your interest in, in these, the species and these questions come from? Uh, so I started my interest, I was an undergrad at Boston University and I was studying biology and I was just really interested in um, these kind of core theoretical biological systems, um, especially like predator-prey interactions, like the lynx hair thing, what, you know, seeing the populations increase and decrease, I thought that was so cool. Um, so I was interested in studying some sort of predator system. Um, and I happened to get a volunteer position at a rehab center in New Jersey. And what they do with new volunteers is they stick you in the songbird room because songbirds love being fed by anyone. They don't care. They just open their mouths. It's instinctual. So they're really easy to care for. And uh, I was absolutely blown away with how quickly they grew from one week to another. So I would go in um, like a Thursday each week and I'd see these birds that can't open their eyes. They're just hatched, a couple days old. And then the next week they're teenagers. And then the next week they're in their flight cages. It's so in like two weeks they've reached adulthood. It's absolutely amazing. And so chickens that we eat are six weeks old. Um, they're full grown at six weeks old. Vultures take two to three months to grow, um, but, and same with kind of eagles and these and larger raptors, but um, uh, I found that to be amazing. So I was like super interested in birds. And then I reached out to Hawk Mountain and got an um, internship there. And I was exposed to uh, working with vultures. I was there to study kestrels, um, but I got to see some tagging of vultures and um, tag some nestling vultures. Uh, and so I just fell in love then and I went down to Ecuador and I was with some tour guides and they kept pointing out all of the really cool tropical birds, the toucans and the parrots and um, the motmots and but everywhere you looked there was vultures and so they just I, re I recognize that people um, either ignore them or um, don't find them as interesting as other birds. And so I had like a kind of a, like a soft spot for, the, uh, for vultures because of that, because um, a lot of people probably are put off by um, their lifestyle, but they are a keystone species and we, uh, they're absolutely essential and they provide you know, millions, if not billions of dollars in economic services for what they do. Great. So um, are there any other questions from, from any of our participants? And again, uh, you'll need to unmute yourself uh, if you do have questions, but I wanted to give people an opportunity to just kind of chime in. Hey, Chris, this is Anna. Mm -hmm. May I go ahead and make my little, my little pitch real quick? Sure, absolutely. Thank you so much. First, um, my name is Anna Kaahanui. I'm with Capital Nature, a local nonprofit. Um, thank you so much, DC Audubon, for putting on this awesome presentation. Julie, um, I was fascinated by your presentation. So I see turkey vultures and black vultures every day when I go out. And so just knowing more about them just is, is so exciting. So thank you. Um, I just wanted to mention, you guys, um, if any of you have heard of the City Nature Challenge, um, it's actually still going on this year, but it's not a competition. Um, and actually, the regional people here in DC, we've made it um, City nature month the whole month of month of april so people have been making observations we set up a separate project for that and we encourage people just out their window in their backyard and safe spaces observing social distancing measures um, I wanted to mention that as of today, we already have 21,000 observations, 2,200 2, species by over 2,200 people, 116 species of birds, um, and that's 1,925 19, observations of birds so far, representing 116 species, and uh, 21 turkey vultures have already been observed, and 17 uh, black vultures have been observed. So I'm going to put in the chat here some links if anybody's interested. Um, we could also use your identification skills too, so if there's anybody that can't make any observations but is really good at identifying birds or anything else for that matter um, we encourage you to go to be an observer so thanks so much appreciate it thanks Anna um, other questions uh, this question just came in uh, will this be available for, for download after the presentation so yes we we have been recording this um, and then uh, we're gonna get on to uh, the process of, of getting it uh, uh, processed and, and put up onto our website uh, and I'm sure we will post uh, on social media 
uh, once we get that up there so, so that people can uh, rewatch it or, or send it to, to folks who maybe couldn't uh, participate tonight. Any other questions? Okay, well, if not, again, um, Julie, thank you so much. Uh, we really appreciate this. Um, this is just a wonderful uh, start uh, to hopefully a series of presentations over the coming weeks. Um, and as I mentioned at the beginning, and, and if people have joined in late, um, if there's anything that you would like us to try to put on it for future programming, uh, reach out to us. Uh, we can be reached at info at dcautobahnsociety.org. Um, if you know of a speaker or if you, a topic you'd like us to try to address, uh, we'll do our best to kind of get some programming around it over the coming weeks. Uh, yeah. So if there's nothing else, uh, I think we can, uh, we can sign off. And, and again, uh, thanks to Julie for this wonderful presentation uh, and uh, good birding for everybody. I, hopefully we'll have some good weather over the coming weeks. Uh, I know the, the migrants are starting to move their way through, so let's go out and find them. Yeah, thanks again for the opportunity. And um, I'm, I'm typing my email in the chat um, in case you um, had any other questions um, you wanted to reach me. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.